Oh yes, Levi Strauss, for example. People here sneered, you know, what what do we have to do with Levi Strauss? And I used to explain to them, you know, he had some fame, and that he had written a letter to me, quite un, unrequested, you know, because he'd read, he'd read Mambo and he'd read some other books of mine, and he said, they were very good, thank you, Ken Burridge, he said, for writing those books. And I know that he appreciated what others didn't, that there was a structure to them, and it was an unconscious structure, more than a conscious one. I wasn't saying I must remember I'm a structuralist. I didn't feel anything of that at all. But I did know how to find out about... Uh, people. So when I had found out about them through the knowledge of, for example, kinship and so forth, I could talk to them. And um, they could talk to me. Because they knew that I knew who their mother was, you know, and so on. And who their mother's mother was. And who the uh, cousins were what we would call cousins, you know. So, um, <clears throat> I didn't um, trumpet structuralism at all. I think, I don't know about my other colleagues, but um, Cyril and I got on very well. I got on with... Um, really people of other other persuasions, you know, people in the English department, Reg Ingram, for example, or there's man, uh, an Egyptian, uh, um, Manzalawi, Ma, Mahmoud Manzalawi, was rather a famous uh, scholar for English studies, you know, literature, English literature. But he went to Oxford and knew a lot of people that I knew and so um, we were friends, you know, good friends. Um, <clears throat> one of my students at Oxford came here as a, an assistant professor, you know. I knew her in Oxford and I knew about her quite a bit. And I was very cheery. I said, no, no. But he said, I've already said yes. So <laughs> she came to the department, and I was right all along. You know, she was a bloody nuisance the whole time she was here. But um, she was okay, but she was a woman who... Oh, how can I say? She was a bit crafty about things, you know, and um, didn't let on too much about. What, but she she'd tell tales. This is this is the trouble. And um, so you had to be wary about what you said to her, <clears throat> because um, she would pass it on to somebody who was. Not disinterested, but interested in a bad way. But we got on together very well. So I felt rather a beast at not sort of supporting her. But I supported her in public, you know, she was good enough. But <clears throat> I told her I couldn't support her any longer because she was buggering things up to be... Um, Frank, you know, as she had done in Oxford, you know, this is, this is what I knew 
of her because she always to, told tales to me. I don't think she told anybody else, but she told them all to me. And I know she was telling some tales to some but other people. But um, anyway, that's the only sort of troublesome department member that I can think of. Um, yeah, we were uh, well, harmonious because we didn't get on each other's nerves, you know. And we um, sometimes in universities, you know, museums are in some sort of rivalry with the department, but we never had that here because. The member of department was in the museum, you know. It wasn't something that somebody specialised in and came and sort of the department was strange. It was somebody from the department who began getting interested in the museum. So <clears throat> I think we brought home to anyhow our students what the Indians were like, you know, here, and that, you know, we had to be a little bit more giving to them than had been the uh, habit in British Columbia. and. That's all that we were interested in locally was um, the Indians and what they thought of us and what we thought of them. But otherwise we all went on to our own specializations and I wrote books <coughs> and um, my games went for the museum and my Q went to the museum more than that. He knew the Indians better. And um, I enjoyed myself. I mean, there's plenty to do around here. There's a lot that I didn't do that I had looked forward to doing, like buying a boat. But I never had time to buy a boat and to go boat sailing, you know, that was one of my recreations. And um, I walked a lot. I took my students on long walks. Only those who wanted to go on long walks, I mean, they didn't have to come, but they came. Some of them up the hills here, you know, in the back and down again. <laughs> but it was fun. I enjoyed myself. And we used to get visiting scholars who'd be here for a term or a year even. And I'd take them for walks and they would enjoy it and say they wanted more walks. And so, you know, I got into the habit of walking especially up these mountains nearby. Not, not to the, uh, not as far as Whistler. I didn't go to Whistler much, though we encouraged people to go to Whistler and, and um, ski or whatever. But I never had the time to ski. I used to go in the early mornings, on a Friday morning, and go up there and come back for lunch, you know, and do a bit of skiing up there. But um, all this nearer one, yeah, not Whistler, but this uh, mount here. But that's life here, you know. <laughs> we used to go to the theater quite a bit because uh, it was, this is quite a theatrical place, you know. People do um, uh, traveling um, 
companies come here a lot, and um, people enjoy the, the theatre here. Uh, sometimes the cinema, but mainly it's watching theatre. And we had a theatre in UBC, which um, people enjoyed. I enjoyed it. Yeah. What can you ask? You were telling us about your students. About them? About them, yeah. Oh, they come from all parts and walks. Why don't you tell them about Kuniko and hmm? how we ended up in Japan? Oh, yes. Kuniko was a student of, uh, of mine. Um, she's Japanese. She'd been at a, a university here and came here um, and um, returned to Japan after she'd studied here for a while. And then she had some say in the Christian University in Tokyo. And they said, would I like to come there for a summer, for a year or so, you know. So I went there. I took leave of absence, and we went there for a year, my wife and I, Anne and I. And um, ah, we had a good time in Japan. It was a strange place, of course, very strange. But um, we got used to it very quickly. It was a, a place of um, earthquakes. This is what immediately surprised us because when we went to our quarters which we were allotted you know a sort of flat it was like this you know but <clears throat> we were told to have our baths full of water and everything ready in case of an earthquake at night and we had little quakes in the part of Tokyo where we lived but um they were rather aftershocks from somewhere else. And um, you could tell when the earthquake was coming because all the crows and the birds, silent. They were new. They knew. And one day we went for a walk in the palace gardens with the woods on either side and we came to a clearing just in there. And there was squawking and squawking of crows. And you wouldn't believe it, but in the middle of the clearing were two crows fighting each other. And these other crows were around the circle, just like human beings. And they were shouting and quack, 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 you know. For one, the other was on top. Oh dear, that was an experience to see crows actually making of this place an arena from which they could watch two of their own having a fight. <laughs> Just what we would do. <laughs> yes. That was fun. And um, what else did we do, love? Well, Kuniko arranged our... So Kuniko our has our been our friend ever since, you know. Yeah. We get letters from her, we write back, and she, uh, she comes a lot to the States, you know, not to Canada, because the States are interested in what, what she has to say, and they have Japanese, um, uh, <coughs> Japanese uh, scholars, you know, which we don't have in, uh, here in in Canada much and um, so she's welcomed in the States more than she would be here because she could, I mean when I say double Dutch you, perhaps you know what I mean that's what Englishmen call people whom they can't understand you're talking double Dutch you know <laughs> But she's 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 translated one of my books, and it's in Japanese. Which one did she translate? I forget uh, which. No one. 
oh, someone knowing about individuals because she was interested in individuals, Kuniko was, and she tried to sell it to the Japanese who have no idea of the individual, you know. You're not an individual, you're a Japanese, and you, if you're in the army, you are A company Japanese, not B company Japanese. And that's your sort of alliance and your friendships. And um, individuality is not a thing that they study much, but she has, she studied it. And she was interested in my idea of individuals. Um, there's a book I wrote about it, um, uh, which was that book. Yes, someone no one, that's right. And she wrote this in, Jap in Japanese, yeah. She had to invent hmm? a language. She had to invent new words to explain your, <coughs> your ideas. <coughs> because no such language exists in, in, in the Japanese. But do you remember how that university was started, the Christian International University? I can't hear you. No. Can you remember how the university started, was started, the International Christian University at Mitaka? Oh, yes. Well, do you remember how it started? No. How it was started? No. Remembered was on the grounds of Mitsubishi, uh, Mitsubishi um, Oh yes, the air. Well, this Christian university, which we went to, was once <coughs> an air, air <coughs> an air station, and um, the path up to it was a, when you approached the university was actually a runway for aircraft, a Mitsubishi aircraft, yes. And the factory, the remains of the factory, because they disarmed it, you know, was, but a little bit of it remained and they manufactured cars, Mitsubishi cars. And that was on the side and the university was on the other side. Yeah. Yes, Japan was interesting, and we went, we went touring in Japan. We went on that railway to the south. What was it called? Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nagasaki, yes. What was the, what was the train called? The bullet train. Hmm. Bullet train. Oh, a bullet train, yes. Well, everybody has a bullet train these days, but it was new to us, you know speeding down the Japanese mainland here. Yeah. <laughs> and the Japanese underground was quite an experience, you know, the um, tube stations and so forth. So crowded, you've no idea. I mean, London is crowded enough, but it's got nothing on Japan, on the Japanese. Absolutely nothing. 